The people brought children to Jesus, hoping he might touch them. The disciples shooed them off. But Jesus was irate and let them know it. Don't push these children away. Don't ever get between them and me. These children are at the very center of life in the kingdom. Mark this. Unless you accept God's kingdom in the simplicity of a child, you'll never get in. Then, gathering the children up in his arms, he laid his hands of blessing on them. So I was uh, sitting and looking at the slides, uh, scrolling before the service, and I noticed that the, um, the flowers on the altar are for my birthday. Uh, not all of them, okay? <laughs> I was like, I, I thought I won the Kentucky Derby or something, but uh, these are a celebration of Annabelle Trough. Uh, we had a celebration of her life yesterday, and she loved flowers and growing things, so all these uh, beautiful flowers were brought by her friends and her family. Uh, but um, the ones on the end are, I guess for me, and, and I gotta tell you, I'm not really all that thrilled uh, with the birthday thing. Um, actually, I, I went and saw doc, the doctor this week, just, you know, I'm, I'm gonna be 59, you know, pushing 60, and, uh, and so the doctor asked me, what, you know, why are you coming to see me? And I, I just had to tell him, you know, I, I got to be honest with you, doctor. I, I look in the bathroom mirror and I, I stare him back at me as just a, a shell, a, a wrinkled old man. I, I'm here because I, I need you to give me a compliment in regards to my health. And he said, well, your eyesight's perfect. really wasn't what I was looking for, but, uh, but on another note, uh, I want to, again, I know we've thanked them, but I want to thank uh, Tara Snyder and Damian uh, Harrington for putting together the, the uh, scripture verses that they've been doing for this series. I also want to take a moment and thank the folks in the AV booth, Steve Proman, Doug Gabler, and, and some of the rest of the folks, Nikki Montgomery's back in the live stream. They've been here all weekend between the memorial service yesterday and then uh, here, the, you know, bright and early this morning for our, our two services. So thank you guys for everything that you, you do. So let's, uh, let's have a prayer together. As ever, God, one of your servants stands to speak. Speak the loudest and the clearest to that servant. Amen. Now the setting for the scripture that was read just a few moments ago is a place called Perea, which in Hebrew is translated the country beyond. Now Jesus and his disciples have traveled to Perea and stopped there on their way to Jerusalem. And I just find it so interesting that Jesus is going through the country or the place beyond to Jerusalem where he will make beyond possible for all of us. Now, Luke and Matthew and Mark, all three of the synoptic gospels have this story about Jesus and how he blessed and interacted with children. Whenever Jesus comes together with children within the life of the scriptures, there is blessing. Mark uses uh, a, a Greek word for children, padia. Now, when Mark talks about children in this story, he doesn't give us any inclination uh, or insight into how old, how large these children might be. What he tells us is that Jesus gathered the children up in his arms. So we know that they're the size that he can still pick them up. Matthew, on the other hand, uses a different Greek word, micros, for children, and it means little ones. That gives us a little more definition in terms of size, but what's interesting is when Luke tells the story, he uses a third distinct word for children, brephos, which means babies. I tell you all that because what I want you to understand and to know is it doesn't matter the size, the shape. Jesus loves them all. 
In fact, a little bit later, we're going to sing a song just about that, about how much Jesus loves children. But what's interesting is before Jesus can get to blessing these children, someone else comes looking for Jesus. There's lots of folks looking for children besides these families. Families that want to be blessed, families that want to be in his presence, somebody else is looking for Jesus. It's the Pharisees. Now Mark tells us the reason the Pharisees have come looking for Jesus is because they want, they're hoping to use this opportunity to ask him a question about divorce and the law. But it's not really a question. What they want to do is ask him a question that almost no no matter how he answers, their hope is that people will see Jesus as not a real rabbi worthy of following. Now, it's not a coincidence, I don't think, that Matthew and Mark's Gospels have three things happen right in a row. The first is that the Pharisees, who know exactly what they're doing, come looking for Jesus to try and trap him with a question about the law. The second thing is the disciples, who don't know what they're doing, try to keep Jesus from doing the very thing that he came to do, which was to fulfill the law, to hang out with people and to fix and bless their brokenness. And the third thing The people who aren't sure if the law matters in their lives at all, they show up because they just want a blessing. Something that blesses their life. Now Jesus deals with the Pharisees by taking their non-question on divorce and instead he uses it to make a moment for teaching on marriage. Jesus' answer shows that he is a whole lot more interested in talking about the sacredness of how marriages come together than he is about talking about how they end. And the reality is that Jesus knew that they already knew the answer anyway. What Jesus wanted was for everyone within his hearing to know how much God loves people. To know that God loves people so much that he gives them the opportunity to live life in relationship with each other. In fact, he created us for that. And that there are these sacred, set-aside relationships which give us the opportunity to do our best to live into lifelong, committed relationships. And Jesus tells them when that doesn't happen for anyone, When those relationships come apart, it grieves God. God grieves with those whose relationships come apart, any kind of relationships, but especially these ones called marriage. You know, it's interesting, you can't come away from the fifth chapter of Mark's gospel and not hear Jesus' answer to the Pharisees. You can't come away from it and not hear Jesus shut down his disciples. You can't come away from it and not hear Jesus as he calls to him the helpless, the powerless, and ask them to come to him. You can't read this fifth chapter and not see how much Jesus valued people and relationships because he knew that God, his Father, valued people and relationships. So Jesus tells us that that God has a high view of marriage and a high view of parenthood and a high view of God's people living life in relationship with one another and a high view of people who come into his presence seeking blessing rather than a gotcha moment. Jesus tells us that God loves being in relationship and seeing us in relationship with one another. God wants all relationships to be healthy and holy and lasting and enduring. In this series that Pastor Patina and I have been uh, preaching um, 
We've offered you some start small things. Some things that if we will do them consistently, we can make a world of difference for ourselves and others. The more and more they happen in our lives, the more and more people can see that there is a different life to be lived and that they can start small as well. Over the last three weeks, we've talked about how we can speak life into the lives of other people and how we can live each moment of our own lives with eternity in mind and how we can live in humble relationship with one another. Those start small, life-changing things, Jesus does all three of them if you take the time to see it in the first 16 verses of the fifth chapter of Mark's gospel. In just those verses, Jesus manages to send the Pharisees packing. He moves his disciples out of the way, just like he moves all kinds of things out of the way that keep us from being in relationship with him. And then he, after he's moved the disciples out of the way, he gets to what he loves to do, what he values, to do life with people, to live in relationship and to be a blessing. You see, those people came to Jesus hoping for a touch. Now, who are they? Mark calls them they. Who are they who are bringing these children? Well, they're the parents. It was part of Jewish culture and tradition to bring a child to a rabbi for blessing. This was usually done or orchestrated by the father, but often was done as a couple. And so the image that I picture that all three of the Gospels portray is parents who are excited to bring their children to be blessed by Rabbi Jesus. They're lined up outside the home where he is staying as a guest, and, and they have their children with them because they're hoping that Rabbi Jesus will bless their little one's lives. I kind of picture it, I, I don't know if it happens anymore because I haven't been to a theme park in, in forever, but, but I remember parents used to line up with their children to get their, you know, get their picture taken with, with Tigger or with Goofy. This is a moment. It's a moment for celebration, for, for memories. Mark tells us it's a chance for blessing. The Hebrew word for bringing here is, that's used is prospero. And what's interesting about that is it's the same Hebrew word that's often used when people are bringing sacrifices to the temple. When people are bringing their offering to be given to God, to, to bring something to dedicate to God. That's the situation We have parents who are trying their best to dedicate themselves to to the tradition of children being dedicated by God and to God. And you know, Jesus has some really interesting things to say about the relationship between children and God. Some interesting insights and ideas. Now, you may not be aware of it, but the climate for children in the age that Jesus lived was very different than our culture today. We, for the most part, have a really elevated view of children and the the role they play in our families. In fact, some of us, I'll just be honest with you, some of our, our parents have way too elevated a view of their children. They can do no wrong. That was not the culture in Jesus' day. Let me, I want to read this to you. This is from the New International Version commentary on Mark's gospel. This is what it says about the role of children in first century Greco-Roman culture. The ancient world did not have a romantic notion of children. Children added nothing to the family's economy or honor, and they did not count. In the Greco-Roman world, one could literally throw children away by exposing unwanted infants at birth. The unscrupulous would collect exposed children and raise them to be gladiators or prostitutes and even disfigure them 
to enhance their value as beggars. If that doesn't tell you something, listen, this is an exchange taken from a letter dated 1 B.C. It's an exchange between a husband and his wife about a recent birth. The husband writes to his wife, if it was a male child, let it live. If it was female, cast it out. Compare that to what we hear from Jesus. Compare that culture to how Jesus talks about children. Verse 16, gathering the children up in his arms, he laid his hands of blessing on them. You see, just like all the other weeks of this series, Jesus turns life on its head for those who are willing to live it with him. He tells everyone who's willing to listen that small things matter. With his willingness to have children not only gathered around him, but seemingly all over him, Jesus signals that God's kingdom is foremost for the least and for the lost among us. We need to be reminded again and again that God does not view power or wealth or celebrity as we do. That Jesus loves just because God loves. And our focus, our focus in this world is that we need to be like Jesus. For years I've, I've used these texts and I've preached messages about living into a faith like a child. We need to concern ourselves with, with a child, having a childlike faith. And it's true, that is how we enter into a relationship with Jesus. But once we're in that relationship, we need to live like Jesus. Once we come to faith, then we're called to live out our faith by being like Jesus and love the things that Jesus loves. If Jesus Christ cares for children, shouldn't we? If Jesus Christ loves the lost and the least, shouldn't we? If Jesus Christ loves those who are far from him, shouldn't we? If Jesus Christ loves those who are scared or angry or hurt or burdened or addicted or trafficked, shouldn't we? You see, our calling is to come to faith as children Wide-eyed, dependent, helpless. But then we're called to live out our faith like Jesus. A step at a time. Powerful. Holy. See, Jesus makes it clear what and who his priorities are. He does that with this very public interaction that he has with his disciples. We've got all these people gathered around. Perhaps the Pharisees are still there. The crowd is gathered all around them. And here's an interaction between Jesus and his close friends, his disciples, those that he lives with. He has some harsh words for them. He says, don't push these children away. Don't ever get between them and me. These children are at the very center of life in the kingdom. So I want to share with you two truths, two takeaways from what Jesus says, two clear statements about how to live a wonderful life. The first is to understand that the powerless are a priority. Not just a thought, but a priority. In this story, Jesus makes it clear that children matter to God, and that means that they need to matter to us if we're going to live in God's kingdom. But not only were actual children to be given priority, but everyone who wants to live a wonderful kingdom life that God offers has the opportunity to become like children. To enter into God's kingdom with eagerness and vulnerability, an inability to earn it, but with full access to it. 
You know, the world we live in spends most of its time, energy, effort, and affection on valuing people who can achieve power, people who can find their way to independence, people who can live their lives and say that they are self-made. And we say that that's how you live a wonderful life. Jesus says you will only find a wonderful life the life that God has in mind for you, if you recognize that you'll only find it through him. You cannot earn it, you cannot take it, you cannot buy it. All you can do is put yourself in Jesus' hands today. You see, that's the opportunity that's before us today. Whether we've done it at any other time in our life or not, is for us to say, Jesus, my life is in your hands. I am helpless without you. I am completely dependent on you. And in that moment, God embraces us and welcomes us into this wonderful home. You know, all those historic pictures that we see, those depictions of Jesus with children all around him and climbing all all over the top of him and, and he's beaming, That's how God welcomes us into his kingdom. Because the powerless are a priority, and all of us are powerless to find the kingdom without the help of Jesus. And all of us, all of us have kingdom value. Twice, Jesus speaks about the kingdom of God. So exactly what is he talking about? The kingdom of God for us, make no mistake about this, is for the rule and reign of God to rule and reign in our lives. Everyone's invited to live in that kingdom. Everybody gets to be a kingdom dweller that chooses to be, and we will not live perfectly as citizens but we're invited to be citizens nonetheless. And God's kingdom is not a someday thing. God's kingdom is an everyday thing, and it is a today thing. In fact, in just a moment, we're going to pray a prayer. It's a prayer that some of you may have never prayed before, to ask Jesus to to take your life And do with it what he will. To ask Jesus to to take you dependent wholly on him. Trusting completely in him. Maybe that is a prayer that you've prayed before. But maybe it's been years ago. Maybe your life has somehow moved away from that relationship with Jesus. Where you are dependent on him for everything. And so today is a day for you to to recommit, to reassess, to say, Jesus, I, my life is yours. I can't manage it on my own. You see, the kingdom of God must be given and offered to us, and we must receive it and enter into it. Jesus made that absolutely clear in the 15th verse when he says, Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. Now we should never think that Jesus is calling us to an immature or a childish faith. Far from it. In fact, to become eternal citizens in God's kingdom requires us to acknowledge our helplessness, and our dependence on God. When we come to an understanding that the kingdom of God is totally dependent on us receiving it, a gift that we receive and cannot ever earn, then for the first time in our lives, we're given permission not to try to be somebody, but to recognize that we are somebody. Through Jesus Christ, we are somebody. We are wonderful. So how many of us this morning are ready to live life dependent and helpless, coming before Jesus for everything? If you struggle with that image, then let me give you an assignment today. By the way, you've got assignments for the rest of the week on the back of your bulletin. 
some start small things to do every day, some scriptures to read and some things to, to do. But, but your assignment today is to, to watch some children. Watch some children interact with the people who they depend on completely for their life. Watch them as they depend on them for food and clothing and shelter and transportation and, and watch how they trust that those things are just going to happen. And I've been a parent of four children, um, and, and we've had just some amazing moments. My wife Dustin and I, she had something to do with it. But we view things so differently. Each of our kids are so different. I remember standing with her in the doorway. Two of our kids happened to be sleeping in the same room, and we were standing there together, and she very quietly said to me with a look in her eye, they'll be gone before you know it. And I whispered back to her, promise? <laughs> they completely depend on us. And the younger they are, the more that's true. But it's not just dependence, it's trust. It's trust. They believe in the sustenance and the life that we offered to them. So are you ready to be a child of God, to live in God's house, to live that wonderful, dependent, trusting life that God offers? It is a wonderful life. And that's the truth.